to the Vermont Institute uh, weekly seminar. I'm really pleased today to have a visitor from uh, the other side of the globe, from Melbourne, Australia. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to do any such. I'm going to uh, ask my colleague in uh, Barnhill to do that because you'll understand why when she introduces him they're doing some work together. But welcome to you all. Um, thank you for being here. And so that I don't have to say this at the end, our next seminar, two weeks from today, in this room will be Peter Buxton, who, who you don't know that name, was a, a whistleblower in the Tuskegee <coughs> study case. So that will be very uh, popular, well attended. I'll put that on your calendar if you don't have it already. With that, I'll let Anne do the welcome and introduction for Professor Benetti. Great. Thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to have with us today Mateo Benetti from Monash University in Australia. And you'll notice when he starts talking, he does not have an Australian accent. He does not Australian, he is um, Italian. Um, Matteo is a political theorist who works on this set of really interesting issues related to cultural diversity and ethical pluralism, and the ethical and political questions that arise as a result of cultural diversity and ethical. So he's written on a, a bunch of interesting issues, including religious diversity, uh, linguistic diversity, political parties and partisanship. And I know Matteo because of his work on food. So he's written on food labeling and food sovereignty and other topics of food. And we are actually writing a book together on healthy eating policy and political liberalism. And just to give a plug, we're going to have a short, like, informal session tomorrow about some of the ideas that we're developing in our book. So 10 to 11 a.m. in this building, room B6519. So just to plug that. But that's not what Mateo is talking about today. Today he's talking about opportunity pluralism <coughs> and children's health. It's a great pleasure to welcome Mateo Bonatti. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? The back yeah. Okay, thank you very much to the Berman Institute of Bioethics for the very kind invitation. I'm honored to be here. I thank you to Jeff Hand, to Susan Meister, to Anne Parnett for all the help with the organization and all the meticulous preparation. So, the, the paper I presented today is uh, based on work I do with um, another collaborator, uh, Gideon Calder, who's based at Swansea University. Uh, Swansea University is once in Wales, uh, used to be based in Wales uh, before moving to Australia uh, uh, towards the end of last year. I was based at Cardiff University. Um, the paper is about um, um, really, it's called Opportunity Pluralism and Children's Health because it's focused very much on the idea of equality of opportunity and how that applies to children and how that applies to children when, when it comes to children's health, more specifically. Uh, so we are, we are not looking at adults, we are only looking at children, and by children, the definition that, that we provide this paper is, those are the formative stages in life where key decisions about them, uh, including decisions about health, are made by their parents, or by uh, an equivalent, equivalent parents, so they're not made by the, the children themselves. Uh, and so we want to look at the relationship between equality of opportunity, health, um, the idea of well-being, the idea of wealth, for children's welfare, ch children, children's well-being, more broadly intended, so going beyond the mere idea of health. So we think that the well-being of children is not just about health, but it's about many other values we, which should be considered when trying to promote children's well-being. So promoting health we, is not sufficient to guarantee children's well-being. And the, the framework that we use, the idea for, for the paper started from um, Gideon and I uh, engaging with this book by Joseph Fishkin, who is a, a lawyer, I believe, uh, at the University of Texas, uh, who published this very interesting influential book uh, a few years ago uh, called Bottlenecks, uh, A Theory of Opportunity Pluralism, uh, a the theory of opportunity for opportunity, uh, where Bottlenecks uh, is a very interesting title because it gives us an idea of the key theme of the, of the book. So the, the idea of bottlenecks is this. Basically, Fishkin tells us to 
think about a quality of opportunity by focusing on those bottlenecks that exist in each society, uh, which basically uh, people have to go through in order to enjoy a range of opportunities in their lives. So he defines bottlenecks as narrow places in the opportunity structure people need to go through in order to enjoy many different opportunities offered by the society in which they, they live. And he gives many examples from the book, some key tests that children or young people have to undergo, uh, maybe bottlenecks, having certain skills, maybe a bottleneck in society or membership in a certain group and so on. So just to give you an example, uh, I was recently, as I said, I lived in the UK before going to Australia, and I was recently, a few weeks ago, uh, looking at the release of the results of the A-levels, which are in the UK, these uh, school results, so people get when they're around 18, and which really influence uh, what universities they can go to, whether they can go to university. Uh, so the score that you get when you get an A star, A, B, C, uh, in the various subjects you've taken, will strongly affect, really, your future education opportunities and your life. Uh, and it seems to me that the A-level system, the A-level exam in the UK are very much a bottleneck that all children, all young people have to go through in order to then enjoy the various opportunities which the UK offers. And the UK offers many opportunities to young people in terms of education, job, many more in my view than Italy, the country where I'm originally from. And yet, unlike Italy, I think that the UK imposes its very narrow bottleneck on people's opportunities, uh, which Italy doesn't do as much. Italy may offer a few opportunities to people, but I kind of think of a, of a bottleneck, of a key test, something which really determines and strongly influences people's ability to enjoy opportunities in their life. Uh, so that's just an example of what a bottleneck might be. Uh, all these bottlenecks uh, that exist in very different societies uh, restrict, obviously, people's ability to enjoy many opportunities, educational, job-related. So what Fishkin argues in the book is that uh, in order to increase people's quality of opportunity, we need to loosen this bottleneck. We need to really ensure that there are not these narrow passages through which everybody has to go in order to enjoy opportunities in their life. And we can do that by loosening this bottleneck, so also by pluralizing. Uh, the various narrow passages to people, through which people uh, can go through. So rather than having just an A-level test, you can have 10 different kinds of tests which test different kinds of abilities so that everybody has an opportunity to basically uh, pass one of these tests and then enjoy a wide range of opportunities afterwards. So they don't just get one chance in one narrow test, which only tests a narrow set of skills. So, now, from this, uh, Fishkin, in his book, doesn't really talk about health. Uh, especially for children's health. He mentions health very briefly. Uh, so what we do in the paper, we, we draw this framework, which we find intuitively very appealing, uh, in order to talk about health and children's health. Uh, and we do so by start, um, we, we, do so, we do this by starting from a classic account of the relationship between health and opportunity, which is the one provided by a philosopher called uh, Norman Daniels. Some of you might know, some of you might not. Who, uh, Drawn extensively on the work of another important philosopher, John Rawls, who is probably the most important political philosopher of the 20th century, in order to develop uh, a theory of health and equality of opportunity. And what Daniels argued is that uh, I summarized it here very, in a very simplified way, but he draws on Rawls' idea of equality of opportunity, uh, of fair equality of opportunity. And so Rawls' view is this. So if you assume that there is a distribution of natural assets in society, those who are at the same level of talent and ability and have the same willingness to use them should have the same prospects of success regardless of their initial place in the social system. Which, to put it more simply, means if you have, say, two children who are both born with the same, by assumption, with the same talent and music, musical skills to play the piano, uh, and they have the same willingness to use these talents, uh, their social background, the family in which they're born, the, the neighborhood, the city, the country in which they're born, or we're just talking about countries, so the region, the country in which they're born, and so on, the class in which they're born, should not affect their ability to develop those skills in their life to become a great musician, a great pianist. Uh, same talent should imply same quality of opportunity uh, if, of course, the two children, the two persons have the same willingness to use those talents. 
found that as an open practice and uh, playing piano, of course, they should not have the same opportunities according to this view because they are more lazy if you want. So you need to put the same effort uh, into using those open skills and then if you do that, you get the same opportunity as the other child to achieve success regardless of your social, economic, class, ethnic, but rather so on. So, uh, Daniels applies this theory, which is very influential in contemporary political philosophy, to the issue of health, more specifically. And according to um, Daniels, and this will be increasingly important throughout the rest of the paper, uh, health is the absence of pathology. This is what he means by health. So, any deviation from the natural functional organization of a typical member of a species. So, in the case of human beings, the human species. So, we, are, we lack health to the extent that we are not able to fully function based on what is normal functioning for a human being. So, it's a very, uh, it's a very narrow conception of health, which is really about the absence of pathology or absence of disease. Uh, it doesn't involve much more beyond that. As, as I said, this will become relevant later on in the talk. So what Daniels develops, uh, based on that definition of health, and based on the idea of fair quality of opportunity, which he borrows from Rose, is the idea that basically any, any impairment of, of our normal functioning uh, will reduce our range of opportunities. So if we lack health, intended as the absence of pathologies, so if we, if we become ill, obviously we will have fewer opportunities in life, fewer opportunities to construct our plans for life, to develop our own views or conceptions of the good. So the more ill you are, based on his definition of health, and the less able you will be to have opportunities in your life. Again, fairly straightforward view. So in, based on this view, he argues that we need to obviously have a, a healthcare system which will uh, be able to rectify, uh, to, to treat people, and to provide people with uh, treatment when they become ill so that they can then uh, enjoy a normal range of opportunities, uh, which they would not be able to if they uh, continue to be ill to, to have different kinds of pathologies. So we need uh, a focus on children specifically. Say we need to uh, invest a lot on the health of children and reap the benefits and the protection of opportunity over the last family. So obviously, when it comes to children, uh, the range of opportunities that we are protecting by providing them with healthcare is even broader. Uh, you want because children are at the early stages of their life. So if we ensure that they are healthy uh, when they're younger, then we ensure that their range of opportunities throughout their lifespan, which is you know, on average longer than that of people already adults, uh, ensure that the range of opportunities will be as broad as possible. Obviously, if we did not provide them with uh, universal access to health care, then many children, and also many adults, would, lack, uh, would have their opportunities reduced because Lack of health reduces your ability to enjoy opportunities in life. Okay. I hope this is straightforward, yeah, for most people. Okay, so let's this is Daniels. I presented briefly Fishkin's framework, this idea of bottlenecks. Now what the, the main task that the paper does is to basically apply uh, Fishkin's critique to the kind of idea of quality opportunity which is dominant in the literature <coughs> and on which John Rawls, on which on both the Daniel uh, Gross is the main representative, uh, we apply that critique to the specific issue of children's health. So we want to show how Fishkin's theory of opportunity pluralism, uh, which uh, Fishkin uses to criticize the general idea of quality of opportunity defended by John Rawls, uh, can also be used more specifically to challenge this link between health and equality of opportunity developed by normal dynamics, which we think is, is a very limited way of thinking about achievements equality of opportunity. So let's start from the first critique that Fishkin makes against roles. Fishkin doesn't talk about normal dynamics. Linking Fishkin to dynamics is what we do in the paper. Fishkin only talks about John Rawls and other mainstream theorists. Uh, it challenges the idea of equality of opportunity, of fair equality of opportunity, because it he highlights a number of ways in which it's very difficult to achieve the kind of goal that Rawls has in mind. Now, the goal is that, as I said earlier, if you have two or more children with the same talent, they should all have the same opportunity to succeed in life, uh, assuming that they put the same effort into 
to what they're doing. So socioeconomic backgrounds or ethnic backgrounds so should not affect their opportunity. So there are a number of problems in this view according to Fishkin. First of all is the family, the family influence, family's influence uh, on children and on their health. So we cannot talk of equality of opportunity without considering how much families influence the opportunity that children have. And that applies generally. The families do a lot for their children. Some of you may know that there's research showing that the parents reading bedtime stories to their children significantly affect their future opportunities and educational, intellectual development, and so on. And that's just one of many things that parents can do. Uh, aside from many things involving financial support and so on, one of the many things that parents can do which will affect the opportunities of the children. Uh, when it comes to health specifically, what is it that parents do that can significantly affect the health related opportunities of their children? Well, first of all, parents make hidden choices, good choices for the children. Well, children do not get to decide, now in most cases, what they eat. And for lunch, dinner, and so on. So it's parents to decide what to put on the table. So whatever the parents choose, whether it's healthy food or unhealthy food, what that will have an effect on the opportunities the children have. Because obviously, if parents feed their children a lot of unhealthy foods systematically, that will basically increase the risk the children have to develop pathologies, and that will reduce their opportunities. Uh, but parents also can do other things that can affect children's their children's health, and therefore the opportunities which are based on health. Uh, transmitting to your children not the interest for sports, physical activity, also providing them with the financial and other tools to engage in sports, physical activities, all of these will obviously affect the, the health of your children and therefore their opportunities. And, and this is to say that also living the choice to live, the choice that parents make to live in certain neighborhoods, cities so on, which could be less or more polluted, that will also affect the health of your children. So this is to say that even if you have a system in place which provides universal health care, which is what people like Rose, people like, like Norman Daniels advocate and consider sufficient to guarantee the fair quality of opportunity of children, even then, still you will, you will have inequalities due to the fact that families deeply influence and affect the health of their children. Even if children have access to free hospitals, free health care, the fact that some parents might provide children with healthy food or encourage them or enable them to do engaging sports means that those children will be healthier than those who do not have parents like this. So, okay, so parents' choice and family's choice uh, significantly affects the uh, health related, the health of children and the opportunities that come from the health or lack thereof. Uh, there's also more generally a problem in the whole idea that the normal science uh, develops based on roles. The problem of actually separating nature from nurture. But Daniels' view is based on the idea, Rose's view is based on the idea that we can basically isolate talent and effort from the circumstances of, of your birth. But that's something which is very difficult to do, something very impossible. How can you actually separate, how can you even calculate the sense? Uh, what's the result of children's pure talent and the effort according to what they do from the effect that their circumstances have had on their talents and the ability to develop and use those talents. It's very difficult to separate those two. Maybe theoretically we can think about it, but in practice, how, how do you actually separate the two? And again, the family background uh, is something that cannot easily be separated from children's talent and children's um, even effort, because parents may also transmit to the children a certain ethos which involves putting a lot of effort in certain activities. So it's, it's very difficult to dis disentangle uh, talent and effort from any background conditions which affect children's ability to develop those talent and efforts. And, and this applies also, also, also to health, because obviously the family background of children uh, will affect <coughs> children's uh, opportunity to children's health, the opportunity to, to develop their talents based on, on their health or lack thereof. Uh, and this is linked to a third problem that Fishkin develops um, or highlights, which is the problem of the starting gate. It's basically the idea that there is no place in life where we can really equalize or even out the 
the effects of historical inequalities, they are the result of certain background conditions. So, uh, as children grow up, and some of them have parents we, who encourage them not to be healthy, to eat more healthily, and get into sports, and other children do not have the opportunity, don't have the background or the support. You, you don't, it's then very difficult to get to a point that you even out, you cancel what's happened before, and you place all the children on the same level. It's very difficult to do that, it's something that doesn't, doesn't exist. So we can never place people on the same starting gate and basically get rid, remove the disadvantages that some of them have incurred as a result of the kind of background, social, family um, system in which they have lived. And finally, what is, in our view, the most important um, aspect of Fishkin's critique to the standard and the quality of opportunity is this, it's the critique of the monistic approach to opportunities that characterizes um, Rawls's view and indirectly done his view. To put it simply, this is people like Rawls, people like Daniels, they think that, say, if we provide all citizens in a society, or all children, excuse, with certain basic resources, primary goods, which is money or access to healthcare, uh, then that will basically be sufficient to guarantee that, that each child or each person will then use those resources to do whatever they want in their life, to develop whichever plan of life they want to develop. Some of them want to become academics, some of them want to become musicians or artists or sports, celebrities, whatever. Uh, so if you guarantee the same currency, the same basic resources to everyone, then everybody will be able to flourish according to their conception of the good. But the problem is that that societies are not built to guarantee that this will happen. Now, the idea of bottlenecks that Fishkin develops suggests that there are very narrow passages through which everybody has to go in each society, and, and this will really preclude for some people the opportunity to choose the life they want to choose. So what Fishkin argues that we need to build a structure of opportunities that instead of fortifying one hegemonic set of institutions by the end, enables individuals to pursue a wider range of life plans and find forms of flourishing the value. So, he uses two examples, uh, imaginary examples, which he calls the warrior society and the big test society. The big test society is something similar to what I mentioned earlier uh, as a real world example, the UK A-level result. So in the UK, these A-level results, even if you have a situation, which is not the case at the moment, but a situation which is a, a, a true uh, equal distribution, fair distribution of resources in the UK, uh, so that in principle, each person, each child, each young person could then choose whatever plan of life they want to pursue. Still, they all have to go through this narrow passage of the A level in order to then have the opportunity to choose their plan of life. Uh, and that's the <coughs> example of the big test society fish in those about. The big test society is a big society in which you have a big test at some point certain age that you have to pass in order to then enjoy the many opportunities that your society uh, provides. And this is problematic because many people will not pass that test for a number of reasons. Maybe because the test is designed in a way that doesn't take into account the diversity of skills and qualities and personalities that people have and so on. Another example, marginal example that he provides is the so-called warrior society. This is a society which can say where you have two paths in life. People can be either warriors or no warriors. Only two choices for people. But once, once, you enter, once you choose one of these two options, then there's no way back. You can't shift to another option. You either become a warrior or a non-warrior. And then you follow that path of life, which is constrained for the rest of your life. Uh, and this is problematic as well, because even though this is not a narrow passage case, a bottleneck, it is a situation where you have a very restricted range of choices, and there's no way for you to shift between the two, switch between the two uh, ways of life. Um, so imagine that there is a society in which you can either become a, a soldier uh, or, or a non-soldier. So, I don't know, a, a society in which you have a very restricted range of opportunities uh, because paths in, in life are predetermined by the structure of the society itself. Uh, I think the big test society captures better what which is trying to say the warrior society, as an imaginary example, is less related, I think, to what happens in the real world. Uh, so what's the problem in relation to health? So we think that Fishkin's uh, account, while it's very useful for criticizing standard understandings of equality of opportunity,
opportunity because it, it highlights you know, this, uh, the presence of these bottlenecks that constrains people's ability to, to choose their preferred path of life. It, it's still limited when it comes to health because its conception of health is also very narrow, a bit like Norman Dynas's <coughs> conception. According to Fishkin, it doesn't talk long about health, but there's a passage where he says that there is a broad agreement that physical health is important for a flourishing life. It doesn't say much more than that, so it's, it's assuming that physical health is important, so we could argue that for him also children's health, the health intended as physical health is very important for children and to provide them the opportunities in life. Um, but we think that it's, Fishkin is, doesn't really focus on the many trade-offs that may exist between health and other values that children, and they may be important for children and also for the, for the parents. So when we think about children's well-being, to focus, to overly focus on their physical health may be counterproductive if we want to promote their well-being uh, or broad intended. So we think that there's a limit in Fishkin's account to the extent that he seems to rely on a very narrow conception of health. So to show the limits of this, we, we can see first that there are broader conceptions of health than the one provided by Fishkin, so the idea of physical health or the idea of lung disease. Uh, so if you look at the social science literature, you can find a lot of evidence about the conceptions which involve the ability to exercise autonomy, function society, spiritual well-being, and so on. But also, and especially, another conception of health may come into conflict with many other things which are valuable for children and their parents and which may contribute to their well-being. So, uh, we think that that constitutes <coughs> a, bottle, a bottleneck. So, we think that focusing, if a society, if a state focuses too much on promoting children's health intended as physical, narrow health, as lack of disease, um, and prioritizes that over other values, social, cultural values, which are important for children, that will constitute a bottleneck, in Christian sense something which will prevent many children from enjoying a wide range of opportunities because the excessive focus on health will prevent them from enjoying opportunities in other areas of life which are not related to health uh, and also future opportunities which depend on those non-health related values. So if we look at some of the um, health, public health policies now which are uh, ethnic policies implemented or proposed in different liberal democracies nowadays if they cut taxes, for months, nudges, and so on. Also, heavy campaigns, information campaigns, uh, many of which are directed to children. Uh, we can see that there can be a trade-off between health and other values which are not, not health-related. So, for example, now there are um, policies uh, which have been proposed, now which suggest to parents to, to fill up their children's plate with vegetables, uh, to provide a children with a healthier diet. So, if we look at how narrowly intended, this kind of measure, this kind of intervention, may contribute to increasing children's health in terms of the absence of disease, absence of pathology, their physical health. But this may also diminish and reduce other aspects which are important for children's well-being, like stress, uh, sorry, conviviality, and uh, lack of stress. Uh, because obviously, if families, parents are asked to spend a lot of time and effort and money in providing the children with the healthier needs, but that takes time, effort, resources, which may increase the stress within the family. It also may reduce conviviality because children may not always be happy to eat you know, the healthier options. Well, also, there is some research, social science, showing that um, quite often you know, family relationships are um, improved when children are enabled or allowed to engage in some unhealthy <coughs> things, uh, which involves eating sweets, for example. Uh, and this is an important part of children's well-being, you know, the relationship with the family, with the parents, from parents. So to overly focus on health, now we intend this, the absence of pathology, uh, and to overly focus on ensuring that children do not eat sweets, do not eat unhealthy foods, may reduce their um, well-being broadly intended. And we think that a society which overly focuses on the promotion of health uh, as opposed to other values, society overlooks other values 
which are important to children's well-being, is basically imposing a bottleneck on those children, on their parents, a bottleneck to their uh, opportunities, because it forces all children and their parents to go through this narrow conception of children's well-being, to which health, as physical health, is central, but in which other values do not play a sufficient role. And we think that's a limited understanding of children's well-being. So, um, this is basically a summary of what I just said. So, a bottleneck for children's opportunities for well-being uh, involves the promotion and prioritization of a monistic and narrow conception of health, uh, intended as physical health or the absence of disease, and this can reduce children's opportunity to enjoy well-being, because it may impose upon them and their parents a bottleneck that they need to pass through with great costs for their well-being. And those costs come in the form of um, worse family relationships, less conviviality when it comes to males, um, greater stress <coughs> than the first. And, and this, when, when policies are based, when healthy policies are based on this view, on this bottleneck view, they, these policies are, <coughs> will in a sense start to shape social norms and the way in which parents think about their children's well-being, and the way in which children themselves, as they grow up, think about their own well-being. So they will be both instructive and corrective, these policies. And, and therefore, this will shape the, the way in which society thinks about children's well-being, in a way that neglects, already neglects values which are not related to health. And, and all of this is also reinforced by something, so, so Fishy doesn't say, and this, this is how we develop this theory and apply it to this context, but it does say something else, which we think is relevant, uh, which is about fear and discrimination. So it does acknowledge that there are many Western societies there's a bottleneck of appearance discrimination, as we call it, uh, in the form of weight stigma. Obviously, there's a way there are certain social norms which um, tell people how they should appear, what kind of bodily shape and weight are socially acceptable. And that obviously is something that uh, constitutes a, a bottleneck because <coughs> children feel that they have to comply with a certain image, with a certain, uh, certain social norms concerning their physical appearance, that constitutes a bottleneck they have to go through in order to be accepted in society and enjoy many opportunities. So this, this reinforces, in, in a sense, to get a bottleneck uh, which underlies many healthy policies in liberal democracies. And all of this also has the negative effect of reinforcing uh, when it comes to healthy eating, especially a very instrumental approach to, to food and to eating, which seem to overlook all the uh, non-instrumental dimensions of food, you know, the cultural, uh, hedonic, you know, the pleasure associated with food, the social dimensions of food, the conviviality, all these things seem to play a lesser role in a conception which overly highlights the importance of health as the absence of disease. Uh, so the solution, what's the solution? Um, what the kind of the, our proposal. Well, the view is that our view is that we should really societies, liberal and great societies, should uh, adopt a, a more pluralized conception of children's well-being, uh, which overcomes the bottleneck view, which underlies much uh, many healthy policies and public health interventions about children. So we should allow states should allow a wider range of bodily states, for example, to be associated with uh, children's well-being and flourishing, and be less monistic about. Um, the different ways and directions in which children will be can be achieved. So, if if um, promoting children's well-being may imply, in many cases, that children are not able to maintain a perfectly healthy weight, uh, and if that contributes, however, to improving their well-being by other by improving other aspects of their well-being, conviviality, family relationships, and so on. That should become acceptable, more acceptable, uh, we think, in, in liberal and private societies. So we shouldn't, and states shouldn't be overly focused on promoting children's narrow uh, you know, overlooking other aspects of their well-being. Uh, obviously, that implies making uh, overcoming of the, the weight stigma and bottleneck. So making sure that different bodily shapes, different kinds of bodily weights become socially acceptable and, and are no longer and then for the perfect body shape or weight is no longer considered a bottleneck to which people like to go cheap and to go in order to enjoy the opportunities in their life and be accepted uh, throughout their life. So we need to prove
pluralize our understanding of children's well-being, um, the center had narrowly intended within that conception of well-being, making one of many routes that can lead to children's well-being, but not the only route of the primary route to children's well-being. Um, there's a second uh, problem with, um, with this bottleneck view of children's health, is that not only it prioritizes health narrowly intended over many other values which can contribute to children's well-being, but also it, it seems it's a view that seems to pri overly prioritize the present. Sorry, the future of the present of children's lives. It seems that now whenever we talk about when people talk about health eating, children's health eating, ensuring that children are not obese, that they have daily exercise, a lot of the focus is about their future opportunities to become adults. Now the, the main idea is that yes, of course, children should be healthy as children, but that's very important because that will enable them to be healthy as they become adults and they enjoy opportunities as they become adults and so on. And this is okay, but there's a sense in which this there seems to be sometimes an excessive focus on the future, uh, which prevents us from seeing the importance of children's well-being for children. So we need to look at what it means for children to have a good childhood, not only to have a childhood which will lead to a good adulthood, if you want. So to give an example about obesity, so obviously research, I mean there's a strong consensus that obesity uh, Childhood will lead, will lead to a certain health, negative health effects in the future, even though there are some disagreements uh, in the scientific community about some aspects of this. But let's assume that if you're obese as a child because you're, you eat unhealthily, you don't exercise, and so on, that will have repercussions for your adult, adult life with uh, the cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, and so on. Even so, uh, we, that cannot be used as an argument to completely focus now our promotion of children's well-being in function of the future. So to the extent that so childhood obesity, for example, uh, may be compatible with well-being childhood, questions of its relation to future adult health will be need to be put into this wider perspective, incorporating the opportunities and forms of well-being available across the lifespan and giving due way to each such stage. So even if being obese as a child will cause problems for you as an adult, that doesn't mean that we should avoid entirely uh, those practices that children may engage in when they are children, um, which may be unhealthy, but which may contribute to their well-being in many other ways. So if eating sweets or eating um, unhealthy meals with their family regularly means the children will be more obese or more overweight than they might have been if they're not engaged in those activities. <coughs> And even if this means that that will have repercussions for the around the life, let's say that if we can quantify, they will live five years less overall, just to simplify things. That doesn't mean that we should avoid those activities. So we should value each stage of a person's life, including their childhood, for what it is and for what the kind of well-being that the person can achieve at that stage in life. So we cannot just prioritize, overly prioritize the future <coughs> adulthood and overly neglect the well-being that children may enjoy as children, even when that will be in my kind of the cost for the child himself or herself. So this can be a controversial view, I, I see, but there's a sense in which sometimes there's an excessive prioritization of, of the future of other two without looking at what may be valuable for children uh, during the, their childhood. Obviously, there, there are reasonable limits that shouldn't be overcome, uh, but it's just to say that we cannot just overly prioritize one stage of life over another. Uh, so, the problem that we envisage is that the narrow health based and future oriented conception of children's well being, sorry, this is a, a, a critique that can be raised against this, this, point, this point I just made. This is the, this is the narrow health based uh, future oriented view of children's well being is still what is considered preferable because uh, children will have more opportunities across the lifespan if they are healthy as children. So, even if, as I said, some unhealthy practices and activities can contribute to children's well-being for children. Still, there's so much that you can achieve in your life, there's so many opportunities that you can enjoy if you are healthy as a child, that we should really focus, continue to focus on the future, on this future-oriented view of children's well-being. So this is an objection. But in response to this objection, we can say, first of all, uh, as I said, there's sometimes 
practice uh, disagreement no, regarding the effects and consequences of some unhealthy behavior in childhood on your adult lack, uh, health or lack thereof. But there are also other reasons why we shouldn't, we still shouldn't prioritize, overly prioritize the future health of children. Uh, for example, forbidding certain <coughs> unhealthy activities and foods may actually make those foods and those unhealthy activities more prized for children because they're forbidden. So overly preventing children from engaging in unhealthy uh, eating or unhealthy activities might actually uh, be counterproductive from this point of view. But also, healthy eating may carry with it social stigma. There's social science research showing that uh, children often are uh, objects of social stigma if they engage in healthy eating in the presence of their peers. So that's something to be considered when we talk about children's well-being, both regarding their well-being as children or young persons, but also for the future of your well-being, because if, as a result of that being, you are the target of social stigma, that may affect also your future opportunity across your lifespan, because it may cause social issues that may have effect on your ability to, to act, and be an agent in, in society, enjoy work-related or educational opportunities and so on. So I think it can be, can this negative effect. <coughs> but there are also other arguments uh, that should help us not to overly prioritize the future. So, for example, some unhealthy practices uh, intended in a narrow sense, so some eating practices, for example, which may contribute to greater risk of disease because they involve unhealthy eating, uh, may actually increase the future opportunities for well being of children or things considered so that. This example that Anne Barnett and, and, and others uh, used in the paper from a few years ago where they talk about a, a weekly potluck supper where parents um, bring their children to this weekly uh, supper at their local church and the, the, the supper involves unhealthy foods, so it is unhealthy in a narrow sense of the term. Uh, it contains foods which uh, may increase the risk, children's risk of certain diseases which are related to eating. And yet the, the supper itself, the contract supper is, is the center of, is the focus of a social activity with a strong religious dimension, uh, with an conviviality. It is something that uh, the, the parents themselves want their children to engage in because they want the children to carry on their tradition in the future when they become adults. So there's a sense in which engaging in this kind of unhealthy eating, or unhealthy activities, can actually, in a sense, yes, reduce some children's opportunities because it may make them ill, some that contribute to their uh, lack of physical health, but it can also increase their opportunities because it provides them with an opportunity to carry on the tradition, uh, which may decide to carry on the future, to make their own children in the future, and, and that's an opportunity that the parents have provided their children with. So the opportunity to embrace and carry on an important religious tradition in which unhealthy eating is an important part, it is an opportunity that you provide your children with. It shouldn't be discounted. But also, the, there's a sense in which healthy practices, healthy eating, uh, parents spending a lot of time preparing healthy meals and cooking healthy meals, may reduce future opportunities if engaging in those practices so parents spending a lot of time and effort in preparing healthy meals means the parents will have less time to do other things for the children, like helping them with the homework or uh, doing more work outside the home, which means more income, which means more opportunities they can provide the children with. Um, uh, so there's a sense in which unhealthy practices can actually increase not only children's opportunities for children, but also their future opportunities, and healthy practices can reduce um, the future opportunities of children if they imply that parents, for example, uh, invest too much time on healthy practices rather than on other activities which may contribute to the children's opportunities in other ways which are not health related, so on homework, income, and so on. All of this to say that, again, we shouldn't prioritize the future because A, the present of childhood, as childhood is important per se, and we should. Uh, give to that importance, as much as we give importance to the future life of children, but also the childhood per se has an effect, an important effects on the future life of children, uh, and sometimes effects which uh, 
run against our intuitions. So that some healthy practices, for example, may lead to negative outcomes in terms of revenue opportunities for children in the future. And I think there are some references, but I'll stop here and thank you very much. I guess, not you, you, you're talking about this, I guess you could 
rephrase that and say every certain accent in some societies is a bottleneck. Uh, so maybe it's just a matter of terminology, but it's, it's helpful. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And the second point you made is about uh, bottlenecks are future oriented. Um, yes, they are. And that's in a sense that's one of the problems here. Because we don't want a future oriented approach when it comes to achievement status. So, in fact, you're right. And then not only they are future oriented, but in some sense that it's one directional. In many cases, the problem is that there's no way back. So, you say you don't want to be in a society in which you either pass the A level or not, and, and that's it. And so, so, we want also more focus on the child per se, not child at uh, a stage where you can prepare for an exam. They will look at this opportunity, but also a place of life, a place where you can enjoy things which are valuable for still. Yeah. Uh, so, um, I know it's kind of a disanalogy between the big test model and the kind of bottleneck that you're talking about. And that the, on the big test model, the bottleneck is keeping you from getting something that is necessary for well being. Right? Whereas on, on this health <coughs> example, you argued that actually the bottleneck is not keeping you from getting something that's necessary for well-being because you want a conception of well-being um, that's consistent with you know, getting well-being even if you don't have a narrow health. And so I guess I just wanted to hear more of an argument for why we should have a theory of well-being on which narrow health isn't necessary. So for example, why shouldn't we have an objective list theory of well-being, for example, where an item on the list is, you know, being able to run around and play sports at like max energy, or having the virtue of temperance uh, and like moderation when you eat and drink, for example. I'm, I'm not saying that that's, you know, the right theory necessarily, but I found the arguments at the end to be. It, it seemed to me that they were arguments against. Um, you know, certain strategies for getting someone to a state of narrow health, rather than an argument for why narrow health is not necessary for well-being. Okay. Um, so I never said that narrow health is not necessary for well-being. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the problem is, is overly prioritizing narrow health. So, or just focusing on that in a very narrow way, and neglecting on the way, the way of many other things. Which may be reduced, may act as a good thing, which may be reduced if you already focus on that narrow health. So, so, the idea would be to have you know, a conception, so a public health strategy where really narrow health is, of course, important, perhaps it's the priority in many ways, but not overly, it doesn't already, it doesn't already neglect other, other, other things which should be taken into account. So, when legislators make laws about happy in schools and so on, or campaigns to, to encourage parents to feed their children healthy diets, they also take into account all these other things that goes on, they go on in people's lives, or the popular example, sorry, the popular example, all these things, these unhealthy practices which are so important to treat as well being in the families. So I wouldn't say that I would have okay. it should be neglected. No, thank you. It's about balancing. One more? Thoughts on that? 
Thank you. Oh, okay, that's very helpful. Um, okay, yeah. What do you think about this in these terms? You, you're right. Okay, there are there are certainly many aspects of children's life which are not health related, which are important for, for their future. Um, thinking about the pop that suffer, just, just because it's, it's so interesting as an example. Um, so what, I used the example to actually challenge the view that focusing on non-healthy non practices um, is bad for children's future. Now the purpose of using that example was to say that an healthy practice that good not only for children's present but also for the future, but not for health-related reasons, for non-health-related reasons which are future-oriented. So being able to carry out the tradition that your family is that embraced uh, to inherit the cultural and religious it's something that's important for children's future. So there's a sense in which I think you're, you're, some aspects of childhood, some aspects of well being, may be more important than childhood because that's where we form our conceptions of the good in a sense, of our worldviews. So you're right, it's something that should be stressed even more perhaps to say, yes, future oriented, yes, but not just because of health, or not only because of health, but because of these other aspects of well being. So I, I think that's, that's actually helpful. I also say that autonomy is, is, is something that the normally the literature sees, something that children are not entirely autonomous, but they develop their capacity for autonomy while children. So there are many things, many aspects of well-being that need to be future-oriented because they have to take into account the importance of developing children as future citizens, future adults who can be fully autonomous in social and political life. So that's, yeah, that's helpful to, to highlight the future-oriented dimension, but not just in relation to health. Thank you. I think we have to stop giving the hour, but uh, join me in thanking Matteo. Thank you.